So this is our third podcast on social contract stuff. If you go back in time, go to partiallyexaminedlife.com and hit the podcast episodes tab. You will see if you scroll back a bit, one on Rousseau, who is about 100 years after Locke, and one on Hobbes, who is 25, 30 years before this was written. And Locke, of course, is the guy that's credited with being the most influential on the Constitution, on the Declaration of Independence, on the founding documents of our country. So thus it is worth your time. Although I was struck in looking back at it, how weird a number of the points are. They're not exactly what you'd expect. It's not exactly the Declaration of Independence. And people on the left and right continue to be inspired by it today in its ambiguous advocacy of unlimited <laughs> ownership, for instance. <laughs> Should we be glad that at least they're still reading philosophy? I don't believe anybody who cites this is actually reading it. <laughs> yeah, that's the point. They're reading blogs that mention it. People are constantly talking about the founding fathers. Locke was not a founding father. <laughs> not quite. He was like a founding grandfather, perhaps. <laughs> yeah. So where do we start with this thing? We could say a little bit about just briefly his biography. So this was 1689 again. 1651 was Hobbes' uh, Leviathan, and that was really influential, Hobbes, and a lot of people responded to it. But this, which apparently it might have even been written like 10 years earlier or something like that. I read speculation about that. So it's not exactly clear what political crisis of his moment he was responding to. But in any case, he was a doctor. He was the private physician of the Earl of Shaftesbury, right, at this time. And at one point, he got exiled, not for his writing, but just because he was associated with political factions that were out of fashion for a little while. But then he got to go back, so it wasn't so bad. Well, if you're not exiled for what you write, you probably weren't <laughs> writing something interesting. <laughs> right. This reading did not catch fire really quickly. It was quite a few decades after that. And then, of course, when we get to the uh, American and French revolutions, so almost 100 years later, then people are quoting this all over the place. And most of the people that he was arguing against are not <laughs> seemingly not legitimate <laughs> live positions right now, right? In fact, the first treatise on government is all just a response to Filmer. Is that the guy's name? It's a response to some dude who argued for absolute monarchy based on the line of succession coming from Adam. So in other words, God gave Adam the earth. Therefore, by right, it should go to Adam's eldest son and Adam's next eldest son, etc., etc., etc. I guess this was enough in vogue that Locke felt the need to write his whole first treatise responding specifically to that to the point that, well, nobody really knows who the descendants of Adam are directly, and no king has actually claimed this as their reason for being in power. And so really, if you should resist any leader that is not a direct descendant of Adam that you could prove it, then all citizens should resist all governments. So that it's a reductio ad absurdum against that ridiculous view. So the second treatise here is his constructive one, where he's looking at the different sources of power, parental power, political power, power of master over slave, and just talking about sort of how each of them comes to be in its legitimate sphere of influence. One thing I really liked was how he starts out with that, where he's contesting the idea of the divine right of kings. And all the reasoning that he has in here is his attempt to come up with secular reasons, with human rights-based reasons for why we have these laws, why we appoint people to govern us and such. And he'll keep throwing bones where he says, oh, but we know that God is the creator of everyone, and we know that we all have to recognize God. But it's still interesting in how he is trying to develop these more secular reasons. And interestingly, even though this is read in the tradition with Hobbes, it's not even clear that he read Hobbes. He doesn't mention Hobbes anywhere in this. But he does bash on the idea of the monarch quite a bit. Yes, yes. Yeah, and he does actually use the word Leviathan. Yeah. <laughs> ah, yes. He was certainly aware of it. We just read The Phenomenology of Spirit, where there was no explicit reference to the <laughs> entire history of philosophy and Western culture, which but apparently was cited in every <laughs> sentence <laughs> implicitly. He helped establish uh, the Royal British Society with uh, Robert Boyle and Isaac Newton. Ah. I mean, he had some pretty exceptional company. So he clearly was extremely well regarded by what can only be counted as the supreme intellects of not just his day, but of our history. So maybe we should start with this foundation for equality. He starts with defining political power. Right. That was the quote. So it's chapter 1.3. Political power, then I take to be a right of making laws with penalties of death, and consequently all less penalties for the regulating and preserving of property and of employing the force of the community in the execution of such laws and in the defense of the commonwealth from foreign injury... And all this for the public good. Only for the public good. Yes. 
he talks about property a lot here, but the way that term was used, it was including your own body. So even though he sounds fixated on keeping track of material objects, when he says property, he also means that nobody should have a right over your person. There's a lot to be said about that. But the first thing is he wants to distinguish, he says, political power is the power of a magistrate over a subject. And he says, this is to be distinguished from a father over children, a husband over wife, master over servant, or lord over slave. Later on, he talks about what the differences are, at least between familial power, patriarchal power really is what we should call it, and tyranny and so forth. But he's taking great pains to distinguish so that you can't draw an analogy between patriarchal power and political power, which is, I don't know if this is the direction Hobbes went, but there were many political theorists, right, who liken a monarch to the father and this, the yeah. subjects of the state as children and all that. And he's saying what political power is, is not the same as what happens in the family. Right. Well, and part of that extended to, to it's not just a matter of the state can't be as strict as a father could be or something like that, because there's also in there limits on parental power, right? Yeah. Children are not your property. You have an obligation to take care of them, but you don't rule their lives, especially you don't rule their lives once they're grown up. Well, and they're also, and we're kind of jumping ahead, but in order for there to be a basis for political power, it has to be a commonwealth of adults guided by reason and children are not developed enough to have reason. So they aren't really in the same place as like a citizen in a state. And there's also the key issue of consent too, that the citizens all get together and they consent to governance while children don't have any sort of consent. That is correct. Right. And if I have my way, they never so will. So are we jumping ahead or going back? <laughs> no, no. That's okay. I think this is a good place as a way of summarizing in contrast to Hobbes. So Hobbes had this idea, the state of nature is very nasty and we will do anything to escape the state of nature where everybody is just constantly coming and kicking us in the head and taking our stuff and killing us. And so we all implicitly, at least, consent to have somebody in charge. So there's somebody we can appeal to who will get rid of all this nastiness. And that's why we have a state. And given how bad the state of nature is, really, however bad the leader is, it's better than the state of nature. So the monarch, in fact, is not even a party. He's not one of the people who signs the contract, the social contract that ends this. He's just somebody who gets put in place by the individual citizens who sign with each other to say, oh, let's just give power to somebody because this is just intolerable. And Locke makes a clear distinction that in that sort of nasty, brutish, and short world, there's a combination of a state of nature and a state of war. In a regular state of nature, there isn't that sort of desire to stop being kicked in the head. I'm not sure that ultimately that distinction makes a whole lot of difference. I'm not convinced of that yet, but we'll get to that. What is the state of nature for Locke? He says, the state of nature is a state of perfect freedom of action within the bounds of the law of nature. It's a state of equality. And he says, it's a state of liberty, but not of license. So for example, you do not have the liberty to destroy yourself, nor do you have the liberty to destroy for example, a creature that's in your possession, if its death is not needed, like if you're not going to eat it, you can't just go around killing your cats and things like that just for the hell of it. And that's because there is a law in the state of nature, and that law is reason. Well, but he also talks about it as God's law. And I guess that's the big question, that sometimes he sounds like a divine command theorist, that this is the law because God says so. But at the same time, he very often refers to reason that this is something that anybody should be able to find out, that he distinguishes that from divine commands received from Revelation, which, of course, only the chosen people late in history who the Bible was revealed to are going to know those things. So while certainly there are going to be God's commands over and above those given by reason that anybody could figure out, none of what reason is going to tell us is going to contradict those more detailed divine commands. So, just out of curiosity, is the prohibition against self-destruction divine, or does that come from reason? It's divine. We are the creations of God, and so to destroy ourselves is basically to disrespect God. Okay. And we're God's property at God's whim. Okay. Right, and God gave everything to us to make use of. So, I, even though I'd like to say, you don't need to refer explicitly to God, it's just basic fairness and something like Kant's principles, getting from reason. I don't see the details in that. 
However, of course, Kant argued against suicide. Well, and that's a big question. Are you allowed to commit suicide or not? And I see him using the God-based arguments here more to kind of bring in a sense of humility that, yes, we have a lot of power. Yes, we can do all of these things, but there's a limit to that. And we need to stop and recognize there's something bigger than us. May I read a quote? Please. Being all equal and independent... No one ought to harm another in his life, health, liberty, or possessions. For men being all the workmanship of one omnipotent and infinitely wise maker, all the servants of one sovereign master sent into this world by his order and about his business, they are his property. Sabrina, there's your point. Whose mm -hmm. workmanship they are made to last during his, not another's pleasure. And being furnished with like faculty, sharing all in one community of nature, there cannot be supposed any such subordination among us that may authorize us to destroy one another as if we were made for another's uses as the inferior ranks of creatures are for ours. Everyone, as he is bound to preserve himself and not to quit his station willfully, so by the like reason, when his own preservation comes not in competition, ought, as much as he can, to preserve the rest of mankind and may not, unless it be to do justice on an offender, take away or impair the life or what tends to the preservation of life, liberty, health, limb, or the goods of another." So there you go. That's the state of nature. I think Hobbes was ambiguous about whether some of the things he was saying about nature were normative or descriptive claims, right? He says we have the right to kind of do whatever we want, but what he really means by that is, as a practical matter, we can. We have the liberty, actually, is the way Hobbes put it. We have the liberty to do whatever we need to to secure our survival. And I think he puts it in that sort of ambiguous way between normative and descriptive because it's something he wants to say we can give away. With the social contract, we can give that away. But with Locke here, it's just normative right from the start. It's more like the state of nature lays out some basic ground rules that still have to be obeyed later on, even when you set up a community or a society. Right, with the exception of the retribution. Right. We have the right in the state of nature to extract justice. Well, that's the thing is that, yes, every man has a right to enforce the law of nature and punish offenders. Yes. And that's what we give up. Yes. But that's not a the idea that offenders can be punished and that the law of nature needs to be enforced. That I see as kind of the ground rule. And then the derivative from that is that if you're wandering around in the state of nature, then you have that right to be the executor of that law. But then later on, you pass that job on to somebody else. You're saying, oh, I've got too much to worry about. I want to grow my crops and raise my family. So I don't want to have to go out and keep enforcing this law. I want to have a policeman do it or I want to have a magistrate do it. So that's mm -hmm. one of the advantages of entering into the social contract. The other of which is the fact that this state of nature easily dissolves into the state of war that you were mentioning. In other words, as soon as somebody violates and takes something that somebody else is, then it's a state of war, which Hobbes would say, well, that pretty much happens immediately. There's no point in worrying about this state of nature prior to that. Locke is talking about how the state of war in a state of nature will basically keep continuing until uh, peace is offered or I think somebody is killed. But in a society that each side goes to a magistrate and they submit to judgment. So basically a state of war can end more quickly and more cleanly if there's a society. Mm. What was your objection, Seth, that you think that this is not a useful distinction? <laughs> There's a motivation of some sort to exit the state of nature and get into civil society, whether it's because the state of nature devolves into a state of war or whether the state of nature is a state of war doesn't seem to me ultimately to make that much of a difference. If the end result is the same, there's a section later on where it sounds like he says almost exactly what Hobbes says about the state of nature. Here he says, I easily grant that civil government is the proper remedy for the inconveniences of the state of nature, which must certainly be great, where men may be judges in their own case, since it's easy to be imagined that he who was so unjust as to do his brother an injury will scarce be so just as to condemn himself for it. You know, where Hobbes, and we had a big argument about this that I think I never relented on when we did the Hobbes episode, and Sabrina, maybe you can adjudicate, but I was certainly arguing with Wes that my perception of what Hobbes said was that in the state of nature, individuals enter into a contract with one another, like an agreement, like you watch my back, I'll watch yours. But since ultimately you can never guarantee that those agreements will be enforced without an external power that you mutually agree to assign the power to enforce the contract to somebody else. It sounds like Locke's saying something here that's not quite as strong, which is basically not so much that we need somebody to enforce 
the contracts that we enter into with each other, but rather the sort of implicit law that already exists needs to be enforced. And we can't guarantee that its enforcement will be consistent and balanced and fair in the state of nature. Hmm. I'll buy that. And, you know, he doesn't need the, we could enter into any kind of contract we want with each other because really the dictates of fair contracts and fair contracts are the only ones that we would knowledgeably enter into. So even if I say, oh, I'll work for you for nothing, I'll be your intern for, you know. (laughs) Oh, wait. If if that's not ultimately in my interest, then maybe I was just incompetent to make that contract or something. In in any case, you could imagine (laughs) if the idea was to enforce some basic rules of fairness then if the government detects some unfairness, it could just jump in and adjudicate it otherwise, whatever contracts you've agreed to. The reason why I think this distinction is important, and I'm reading it this way, is that he has that section right in that same area where he says, if we can't guarantee in the state of nature that any one individual will execute or enforce the law fairly, then we also can't expect that an absolute monarch, that is to say the state embodied in a single individual, Mm -hmm will not exercise the same poor judgment. And that, that's why absolute monarchies are absolutely are the wrong way to go about doing civil society. And that's what I thought was his counterpoint to Hobbes. Right. I think, though, Seth, going back a little bit, the condition in the state of nature, I would say that it is significant because that determines whether you're running away from something or you're running to something i.e., are you so desperate to get out of this horrible, nasty situation where people are kicking you in the head, you'll be willing to submit to a brutal monarch, perhaps, or you'll go, just anything, I don't care, just get me out of this, versus a situation where you say, well, we've got this situation, it's it's pretty good, but there's some things that could be done better. Hey, I've noticed there's some unfairness when these things are getting adjudicated, we should probably get something set up. I would say that there is a significance to which type of state of nature you're coming from. And that can determine how much of your rights, for example, you can be expected or understood to give up. That's fair. And one thing I thought was pretty cool about his uh, notion of the state of nature is that it's not just necessarily talking about some ancient time before governments were formed. Just any time there's not an adjudicating power, then you're in the state of nature. So different nations are in a state of nature with each other, he says. And he talks about the uh, Swiss and the Indian in the woods of America, right? And two men on a desert island. Yeah, there's a weird passage where he says, the American Indian, like in England, France, or Holland, those countries have no right to exercise any kind of influence over the Indian, and they have no obligation to recognize their authority, which is basically puts them in the state of nature. So until we have the one world government ruled by spirit, <laughs> the end of history, we're kind of stuck. But that at least makes it sound like the state of nature is not so bad that, you know, it can create problems if a foreigner comes to your country and this is your laws and like, well, how do you adjudicate that? Is it by your laws or by their laws or there are issues to work out? And certainly the state of nature then can turn into a state of war. And I think when you're thinking about it between nations, like, well, that's an obvious difference. Are the two countries at war or not? The big revolutionary thing about this is, of course, just the idea of government for and by the people. Well, maybe not by. Government for the people. (laughs) Government has to be representative of the people. And that's the big advantage out of this. But on almost every other social point, he comes down with the status quo for his society. So even though it sounds like slavery should not be allowed, apparently if you're in a war with another country and that other country surrenders, then at least the people who are actually fighting you, not their families, not their kids, but the actual soldiers, you can just take them and keep them as slaves. I mean, what you're in fact doing with that is perpetuating the state of war. It's not like you have a contract with your slaves because they're just there as your possessions. I don't know. He didn't get into details then. But actually, no, I thought he clarified that you get to take those people who fought against you in that war. You get to take them as slaves, but you basically make them work and you get to take back from the labor that they create enough to compensate you for the cost of the war that, that you spent. And then I guess after that, you're supposed to let them go. So it's a very gentlemanly sort of slavery. Yeah. If we're going to talk about that, we should probably make that clear distinction between state of war and state of nature and how that all relates to slavery, since this is the big contending point for the listeners. Mark had mentioned that Locke had worked for Lord Ashley, who was also what? The Earl of... The Earl of Shaftesbury. The Earl of Shaftesbury. (laughs) (laughs) The Duke of Sandwich. 
This lord was responsible for setting up something called the Board of Trade and Plantations and was part of the Lord's Proprietors of the Carolinas, as in the American Carolinas. And Locke was the secretary of both of those organizations. And so he was very much aware of what was going on with the slave trade and plantation system. And there were apparently a number of British citizens in Barbados who wanted to emigrate to the Americas and bring their slaves. And there's a whole bunch of stuff surrounding that. But Locke says, and I actually thought this was fairly unambiguous, but I guess people are looking at his involvement in that organization and not so much what he wrote philosophically, that the state of war is a declaration or a design to either take somebody else's life, possessions, or to make somebody else a slave, mm -hmm. as opposed mm -hmm. to just living alongside each other without that intention, which would be the state of nature. I guess you can put it in terms of the state of war involves intent to kill, steal, or enslave, whereas the state of nature doesn't involve that. Well, right. The person who starts the war, right? The person who starts the, the war, right. And so if you enter into a state of war with somebody, then what changes from the state of nature? You're forfeiting your life. Whereas in a normal society, if somebody accosts you on the road and is trying to steal your stuff, you can shoot them, right? Because there was no way, it was an immediate danger. It's self-defense. But if they go in your house and lock you out and say, it's mine now, ha ha, you can't just go shoot them. You have to appeal to the magistrate. So that's in a state. So justice should ideally only be to the extent it should be eye for an eye, maximally. Whereas if there is no one to appeal to, then you're authorized to do whatever you need to. And this sounds very much like Hobbes to prevent, you know, once a person enters into a state of war, say by stealing your goat, you can just go and kill them. Because how do you know that they're not going to steal more? How do you, and once they've shown themselves to be untrustworthy, there is no magistrate to appeal to. There's no way to end this war unless they apologize and give you back your goat or equivalent restitution or they die. And that's essentially what's happening. You know, if I take the French army and attack England, then me and all the other Frenchmen that are fighting there, our lives are forfeit because we're the aggressors and it's the same thing. There's no UN or whatever that can decide this dispute and can say, smack down on you, France. Not only, you know, you have to give up this and this and this and so unless France then surrenders and sort of throws themselves on the mercy, but in any case, even if they do that, it seems that England would have the right to take all of the fighters as slaves to just prevent them from doing anything like that in the future. And on top of that, you could go to France and seemingly take enough of their possessions to make up for the damage that they did, but no more. And you can't take even as much as the damage they did if that would make all the French children starve. <laughs> right. <laughs> You have right. to give them an installment plan. You have to have offer <laughs> <laughs> terms that they Someone could live with. Someone think of the children. There uh, seems to be a temporal distinction, too, that if there's a robbery attempt in progress, then you can do all of these things to protect yourself. And right. similarly, later on, when he talks about the state of uh, slavery, that if someone is trying to enslave you, then you can kick and fight and scream and try to kill the person. And yet, if you are already a slave, he doesn't really seem to say much about it, which I almost read as an implication of, well, you had your chance and you lost. So now you've got to suck up and put up with it. I don't know about that. I mean, there is a section where he says, you can never... You don't make a deal with slaves. You can't sign your life over to somebody. Well, not only can you not sign your life over, but you're constantly in the state of war, even in master and slave relationship. Mm -hmm. So right. it's not like you become a slave and then suddenly you're obligated to follow direction. You have every right to go after the master by any means necessary whenever you want to. I think it, it's not even that it's right for you to do that. It's just that right, the criterion does not apply. And this sounds very Hobbesian, right? Because mm -hmm. for Hobbes, there is no normativity outside of a government telling you what to do. So if you're in the state of nature with somebody, then there is no right or wrong. That's the way I interpret it in this mm -hmm. case. Now, it still seems like the law of nature, God's law, applies to everyone. That would apply to slaves too, right? If you put your life in forfeit and are taken in a war, again, so it was a just war by the uh, person who took you as a slave, then there's something fitting... <laughs> If you're going to really strictly go with the law of nature, then you kind of take what you can get, right? Whereas if you're a slave under other circumstances, there's no way you could be bound by the law of nature like that. Like you were saying, you have the right to defend yourself in any way. Well, true, but he conveniently doesn't think about the slaves that were taken to America, for example. They were pretty much minding their own business in Africa, and then they were taken. They didn't go try to invade England or the American colonies. 
So I just don't see any discussion of that sort of circumstance. Sounded like you read something about this, Seth. What I read about was uh, on the Wikipedia page and on the Stanford Encyclopedia page was about people were looking at the philosophical work and trying to reconcile it with his work as a secretary of these two organizations because he helped draft the Constitution of the Carolinas. Mm, that allowed slaves, yep. That allowed slaves. And so people are trying to figure out exactly what he wrote, what he approved, what he amended, what he didn't, et cetera, et cetera. And there are people that say one of two things. Either he was a coward and he didn't put into practice what he wrote about philosophically, or he was a hypocrite and he was a racist and a pro-slavery, but he philosophically was against it. And what I'm saying is, reading this text, it seems to me fairly unambiguous that from a natural rights slash political power perspective, slavery is never justified unless you are the conquered on the unjust side of a war. Yes, war. Right. You have to have started a war and be unjust. And then when you get conquered and you get enslaved, it's entirely appropriate. Yep. And that's the only circumstance. And apparently some people have tried to read then that somehow the African slaves who came to the United States had engaged in such an unjust war, et cetera, et cetera. And this is apparently the big bone of contention with Locke as far as this topic is concerned. I'm just saying that from this text, it's pretty unambiguous to me. You can't make yourself a slave. And if somebody puts you there, you get in a state of war and you have every right to fight it. Right. And just to clarify what I was trying to say earlier that so if you are a slave owner who won a just war then it is right for you to keep the slaves but as far as the question of is it right for the slave to obey you i think there is no answer to that i think the right does not apply you're not obligated as a slave even if you were in the wrong to lie down and let yourself be bossed around but it's also you don't have the right under the law of nature to rebel either i feel like you've put yourself out of the uh yeah th this is the way they talk about it transgressors put themselves sort of out of the law of nature mm -hmm. that's why it's okay to execute <laughs> right to execute criminals it's not murder because they're not citizens anymore. Sorry, I shouldn't even say not citizens. They're no longer rational beings. Yes, exactly. He uses the analogy of wild animals lots of times. Put them down. And you don't ask, what are the lion's rights and responsibilities in terms of letting itself be put down? Like, that's just not, doesn't make any sense. So maybe he's just a huge racist and thinks that people from Africa just are more like wild animals. And so you can just treat them however, uh, you know, you can't just kill them willy-nilly if they're like your property, your pets or something, but you certainly don't have to give him freedom. Maybe. I don't know. He doesn't talk about that specifically here. Yeah. Well, I don't want to belabor the point. Yeah. yeah. I just thought that he conveniently didn't talk about it, <laughs> which is pretty consistent for the issue of slavery in America when they talk about all men are equal and, and all of that, that they kind of walk away and pretend that the American slavery issue doesn't exist, or they try to find a way to explain it away. Yeah. Well, since we're on the topic, what about, we brought up children. What about women? We had the uh, husband's right <laughs> over his wife. That was really interesting because he's talking about paternal power and then he stops to muse. Well, actually, I don't mean paternal. I really mean parental. And then he goes on this really interesting thought process about how a husband's right shouldn't necessarily outweigh a wife's and, and how a mother yeah. could take care of children. And when I read that, I thought, oh, that's really interesting. I wonder what feminist thinkers think about this. So I looked it up and there seemed to be a lot of feminists who really took issue with him for various reasons. And I was kind of surprised at how hostile some were to Locke. And then there were some people who were critiquing that position saying, no, actually, he was being pretty aware of, of women's rights. The fact that he said every person has a right to their body, the implication there is that a woman has a right to her own body. And he recognizes that a woman who brings property to a marriage, that property is hers. And that's pretty progressive for his time. Yeah, it does seem like he's, I mean, just like the liberal point about the parents right over the children. It's not so much that parents have dominion over their children. It's just that they have responsibility to care for them. And the kid, before he or she is of age, well, again, the issue of rights doesn't even really occur because... The child is pre-rational. They can't exactly. make rational decisions. Very, very Kantian view. So you can't really have rights unless you can make rational decisions. But at the same time, other people can still have duties regarding you on similar grounds why you can't just kill your livestock and kill your pets and things like that. But sort of above and beyond that, like you were saying, there's parental, not just fatherly, but motherly responsibilities to guide the minors until they are of age. And then there's a debt of gratitude 
that is owed by the kids throughout their life to their parents. But that seems it's not you have to obey them in everything that they ask you to do. It's just a matter that you should respect them, right? Honor thy father and mother. That doesn't mean mm -hmm. that they get to choose your spouses for you and choose your jobs and whatever. And so the same way with women, he said, oh, well, naturally in a family unit, at least typically, the man would sort of be the more competent to rule the family. So yeah, you know, the woman would want to do what he says. And so the family would want to do what they say. But there seem to be limits on that. Like yeah, you were saying. it's a much softer position. Because even when he's talking about in the state of nature, all men are equal, he says, but some are more equal than others. Some are have a little more ability, some are a little bit better. So he recognizes this general continuum that some people are just better at stuff than others. So in this case, he says, yeah, men tend to be a little better than women at some of these things. So we'll probably see this, but that doesn't mean that the woman doesn't have rights and she doesn't have things that are hers. So he made a pretty clear delineation there. So can we, let's talk more about property because this is the kind of weirdest part <laughs> in, in his whole thing. I mean, I already mentioned, yes, okay, by property, he doesn't just mean stuff. He means your person, but he has a lot of talk about, well, starting with land, right? Actually, he doesn't start with land. To start with acorns? That's right. So this is actually, I think, an absolutely fundamental and brilliant contribution to human society. So he talks about God's commandment that God gave the earth to human beings and the fruits thereof, et cetera, et cetera, but also the commandment to improve it. And he says, that this is section 27, you have property over your person, Therefore, you have property over the labor of your body. And if you take something out of the state of nature and mix your labor with it, then you, you basically have property over that. So he sets the groundwork by saying, imagine this, the sort of original state of nature or what have you, and you just have the entire earth and it's in common for everybody. And everything just kind of either grows from the ground or falls off a tree or swims in a river or whatever. And you have a perfect right to go and go fishing or gathering or hunting or whatever the case may be. And even though you, Sabrina, Seth, and Mark all kind of share in common, let's say the deer in the forest, if I go hunting and I kill a deer for dinner, the fact that I have used my labor to hunt and kill the deer makes that deer mine, and you have to respect my property there. Now, prior to me killing it, it was the common property of all, if you will, or we don't want to use the term property because property doesn't apply, but it was common to all. And he also, he comes from the assumption that there's plentiful resources. And so, yeah. Seth, if, <laughs> yes, if, you, if you go and kill a deer, then that's no problem because there's plenty more deer where that came from. So Mark and I won't go hungry. That's right. He does talk a lot about how it's great that we're still in this position where there's all this land available and people haven't come crowded up against each other. <laughs> There's huge tracts of land. That's right. Well, but he's talking about in the state of nature. He's not talking about Europe at the time. No, but he does yeah. mention America as being like that. Like, America is just the wonderful, amazing place. Yeah, you can go to yeah. America and you can still just go take whatever you want because it's common to all and just mix your labor with it. In the beginning, all the world was America. That's right. What doth Locke say about dibs? <laughs> can I call dibs? What? It just makes me want to, when he gives go a formulation a like this. <laughs> Mine. Yeah, to come up with little puzzles for him. Like, I chased that deer all over town. I chased that roadrunner night and day. And you finally caught it. Oh. But it's most of my labor. This is making me think of tagging monsters in MMO games <laughs> where you claim a monster and, and different programs have different ways of, of assigning credit. It's very Lockean. I should get the XP from killing that dragon. I'm the yes. one who got it down to one hit point yes, just because exactly. you finished it off. Or it's, I hit it first. It's mine. <laughs> yes. Oh my. Sorry. Did we I just, just enter geekery? Yes. <laughs> we just entered a geek zone. We've gone someplace that we have not yet been on this podcast. Oh my goodness. Mark is a geek, and I'm a former geek, but I don't think Wes. Wes is like an iPod, iPad kind of geek, not an MMO or MMORPG uh, kind uh, of geek. I've actually never played it. I played uh, when they were just text. When I was in Austin, I spent a, a week Muds? or so on a mud. Oh. On, but I have not done the high-tech versions of that. Uh. Not out of any moral qualm. I just haven't. Let me just give a kind of a 
quick summary and you guys tell me where I'm missing something. So you have the entire earth with all these things in common. If you mix your labor with something, it becomes your property in the way that there's that chain of trust, if you will, from ownership of your body to ownership of your labor to mixing your labor that gives you ownership of a thing. And initially we talk about things like fish, deer, acorns, and so forth. But then we start talking about land where if you claim out, stake out a plot of land and you improve it, because the land is so much more productive than it would be otherwise, like if it was fallow or wild, obviously, A, you have the right of property because you've mixed your labor, but it's actually a good thing because you're generating that much more out of it than there would be if you weren't mixing your labor with it. Now, there's a boundary on this, which is that your mixture of labor with the earth and the fruit of the earth should be strictly for the purposes of your use. So you're only supposed to take as many acorns as you can eat before they rot or plums, I think is another thing that he mentions. And if you end up with an abundance of these things, or if you start farming and you generate more food than you can eat and it goes to waste and it rots, then you're violating the law of nature. But if you can trade what you generate or collect or what have you to somebody else who needs it, who will use it, and they give you something in exchange which is more durable or which at least lasts long enough for you to either use or trade it, then that's okay. And what we end up with is the concept of money, because money is essentially the most durable <laughs> item, because it, of course, never rots like actual goods or services for that matter. Yep. And I like this passage to put nature lovers into fits. This is from <laughs> number 40. I think it will be but a modest computation to say that of the products of the earth useful to the life of man, nine-tenths are the effect of labor. Nay, if we will rightly <laughs> estimate things as they come to our use and cast up the several expenses about them, what in them is purely owing to nature and what to labor, we shall find that in most of them, 99 out of 100 are wholly to be put on account of labor. And, oh. and even just refers to land that's not cultivated as just waste. This yeah. is waste. Not an ecologist. <laughs> But that goes with the God gave us everything. He gave us these animals for our use. We can eat them as much as we want. Well, wouldn't you rather have bread more than acorns and wine rather than water? Yeah, I'm not sure I can disagree with this. <laughs> I mean, that's why we have nature preserves and like things like aquariums. <laughs> we just want a little small corner. See, even that is even that is mixing our labor. Nature is better when we mix our labor with it <laughs> by creating zoos. <laughs> and aquariums and such. Oh. At least you should tag all the wild animals. Oh, no. At the very least, we should say dibs. We should sponsor them. I sponsor orca, a whale in the wild. I don't but have to do anything. Of giving giving uh, dolphins and primates rights now, so we can't own them. We can only make them work for us or something. Only if we beat them in a just war. Yes. <laughs> so so they, they have to pick up a fight with us first. Oh my god, that is totally the next, that has got to be a book. Those fucking dolphins coming on to my lawn. The dolphin jihad. Taking my tuna. Oh they god. Ask for it. That would be totally awesome. But yes, so you've got all of these things that you are gaining as your property. You're picking acorns, you're, you're picking apples, you're improving the land, and all that great food will go bad eventually. So you have to trade it for something that won't go bad. And so that's where we got the idea of currency, gold, silver, and diamonds. But it's just funny that this starts with something that a Marxist would be very excited about, this labor theory of value. Yeah, that's what I was thinking when <laughs> yeah. I was reading this. Is or an environmental, you know, that Thoreau lover type, whatever you make with your hands, that's yours. And that's, <laughs> and don't take more than, you know, than you can make use of. Oh, but then it's okay to do that. And you're within your rights to do that. You're also within your rights to trade for money just because everybody happens to have agreed that money is valuable. It's completely irrational why gold should be valuable in itself, why that thing was picked other than it's just more durable. But since everybody happens to agree on that, then it's okay to trade for that. No harm, no foul. Even if we don't even have a government yet, right? It's just if people agree to it, that seems to be apart from what some government should say, oh, this is money. Even in the state of nature, you can have legitimate trading. As long as the way you got the goods is legitimate, then it's okay for you to have them, even if they grow to disgusting amounts, as long as you're not wasting them, whatever that That's means. Right. Mm -hmm. The big question, though, is would you give your nuts for a piece of metal if you were pleased by its color? <laughs> <laughs> 
That is... He says it's te- end of section 46. Again, if- I remember, yes. yes. <laughs> well, I guess it depends on whether or not I believe the person who was giving me the pleasing colored piece of metal was actually going to use the nuts. <laughs> Five extra or nuts. Or if they were going to go to waste. <laughs> I think nuts have a pretty long shelf life, though, so they probably won't go to waste very quickly. Not as long as you think. (laughs) I'm going to sum up and take us into civil society here. So, in section 63, the freedom then of man and liberty of acting according to his own will is grounded on his having reason, which is able to instruct him in that law he is to govern himself by and to make him know how far he is left to the freedom of his own will to turn him loose to an unrestrained liberty before he has reason to guide him is not the allowing him the privilege of his nature to be free, but to thrust him out amongst brutes and abandon him to a state of wretched as as much as beneath that of a man as theirs. This is all about children and so forth. But the bottom line is we, as creatures of reason, given this law of nature, which I guess we can call God's law, take our rightful place in mixing our labor with the earth and the fruit of the earth to create property and eventually durability. And that is essentially the nature of the state of nature. It's the The characterization. It is the characterization (laughs) of the state of nature. And somehow all this can be discussed as being done prior to the establishment of civil society. Yeah. But at some point we have to. Well, and in the same way, even it sounds ridiculous that money would exist before civil society. Well, you know, how do different governments trade with each other? There's no master currency. I mean, now there's the exchanges that determine the rates, but at the time he was writing. And just to kind of throw one back at the anti-ecologist, he does say things should not go to waste. There has to be an outlet for the consumption of all of these goods. Insofar as we live in a consumer society that produces far more than can possibly be consumed or that is healthy to consume, we would be violating that principle. Doesn't he also say somewhere in the state of nature that we have the responsibility to help each other? Or does he not say that? In other words, if you have extra nuts, you should give them away. Mm. I think he gives uh, several ways that you can avoid being a wasteful jerk. And one of them is to be charitable and give it to someone else who needs them. That's optional, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, he says, if you waste it, then then you suck. But here's some options that you have so you're not being wasteful. So you're not obligated to, but that's one of the things you could do. Before we get into the civil society, like, what do you guys think of this whole, there is normativity in a state of nature and it supports property in this way? I mean, do you follow him on this? It makes as much sense as the other ones. <laughs> as uh, Hobbes on state of nature. and Yeah, I, I mean, Hobbes and, and Rousseau, it, Locke, it's... He's making an effort to be very grounded in talking about something that's kind of a common experience. We all have to eat. We all have to pick up acorns or grab apples or whatever, find stuff to eat, you know, make a shelter. So we have to chop down trees or or gather building materials of some sort. So I think in that aspect, he talks about a very practical aspect of existence that we do work so we can get stuff. Right. And at least it seems in that way to be more engaged with real life practices than, say, just an abstract utilitarianism to say, God has created us all to be equal and we all have to take care of each other. Like, well, what does that mean in practical terms? And also, this is social contract philosophy. So it's talking about why do we have a government? Why do we have laws? What should a government be doing? And then you get things like utilitarianism, which is less about what is the origin of a government or why do we have this and more of, okay, how do we deal with these conflicts that now come up when you've got 99 people who want to sacrifice one person to the utilitarian monster? Is that okay or not? So I I think that they address different sorts of issues and different sorts of problems. All right. I will stop delaying us then, Seth. Go go on to civil government, (laughs) since that's really what he wants to talk about. He kind of goes through this, I guess you could call it almost like a, a sort of genealogy of the different types of, I want to call them social relationships. That's good. Power. Maybe that's power relationships. Yeah. So there's husband and wife, parents and children, master and servant, which he expands to the general concept of family. I guess you can you know, think of a small group that included parental figures, children, and perhaps servants. That would be you know, the family unit. And that none of these things actually constitutes a civil society or political society. It's only when people join together, either in these family units or individuals join together in what he calls a commonwealth, mm-hmm. that you get political or civil society. 
And I think Sabrina already mentioned this earlier on, but the difference is in the familial dynamic that has husbands, wife, parents, children, masters, and servants, there are not a set of what we'll call equal rational creatures or beings that are voluntarily giving up their own private power or self-determination power to the public to form a commonwealth. And that's what differentiates those groups or those power relationships from civil society. There was one part where I kind of wanted to focus on section 90, which I thought was his fairly explicit rebuke or counterstatement to Hobbes. Hence, it is evident that absolute monarchy, which by some men is counted the only government in the world, is indeed inconsistent with civil society and so can be no form of civil government at all. For the end of civil society being to avoid and remedy those inconveniences of the state of nature, which necessarily follow from every man's being judge in his own case, by setting up a known authority to which everyone of that society may appeal upon any injury received or controversy that may arise and which everyone in the society ought to obey, etc., etc., and so is every absolute prince in respect of those who are under his dominion. So he's trying, I think, to say fairly explicitly that, look, his concept of a commonwealth which he distinguishes from a government or a city or anything like that. A commonwealth is a voluntary assembly, if you will, of rational agents that give up the enforcement of the law of nature, mm. their own private enforcement to the public will. A civil society is not consistent with the idea of absolute monarchy because you have to have this collective, the public that you give your executive power up to has to be publicly accountable official or body as opposed to an absolute ruler of some sort, which makes it sound a lot more democratic. I don't know that it's more democratic, but it's certainly anti-royalist, anti-monarchist. Well, they can put whatever form of government, the legislature can put whatever kind of form of government it wants in place, right? It just has to represent the will of the people and be looking out for the people's interests. 